We are slowly moving ahead. Now we, we are going to the sixth process, which is photolithography second, and then uh, oxidase. Because um, if you observe keenly, uh, you can see that only at the two ends you need uh, field oxide, and uh, at the middle you do not want field oxide. Now, if you, if you think what was the reason why we kept uh, the field oxide at the middle is that at the middle you have an area that is called the uh, gate area or the channel area and the channel area you do not want diffusion is not it. So, uh, the oxide that was present in the channel area was uh, helping to prevent um, doping uh, happening in that area. So, uh, doping will happen only in the two sides and doping will not happen at the middle. And uh, now uh, to the uh, steps that are coming forward we do not want this uh, middle uh, oxide and now we have to do something and remove this uh, oxide in the middle. And for that we need to do another photolithography where uh, we have to spin coat photoresist and then uh, use another mask and expose uh, the photoresist to light such a way that uh, the uh, the photoresist will stay only at the edges uh, where the oxides are there and uh, all other areas uh, photoresist has to be removed. And once you do that photolithography process that, that is the spin coating of photoresist then exposing of the wafer uh, through the uh, mask and then, uh, uh, then developing this photoresist you, you are free to then do the etching process where you you can remove your oxide uh, at the middle of the uh, device where the channel was supposed to be found. And uh, so that uh, will give you two oxide islands at the ends, the two green oxide islands at the ends and then uh, at the last you remove the uh, photoresist. So that you will have only uh, the things that are uh, required because photoresist after the process is not required. So, you have to remove the photoresist every time and if you want photoresist for a next uh, process you have to coat photoresist again and use. So, now uh, we are uh, moving closer where we, we have uh, done uh, the removal of the uh, middle oxide. Now, instead of this middle oxide what do you want? You want a gate oxide. If you remember the uh, first uh, first few slides that I was showing the uh, MOSFET structure over the channel region you need to have a very thin oxide and uh, this thin oxide uh, has to be extremely good because uh, you cannot afford to have any uh, pinholes or any deformities or defects in this oxide. Uh, because that plays a crucial role in the working of the MOSFET. Therefore, uh, you have to do uh, dry oxidation for the gate oxide, you are not allowed to do typically uh, you are not allowed to do wet oxidation for the uh, gate oxide instead of that you have to do a dry oxidation and uh, with dry oxidation you will get uh, a, a very thin nice uh, uniform layer of uh, oxide uh, as you see here uh, in the orange color. And uh, now, now we do not want uh, this gate oxide to be there in, in all the areas, you want the gate oxide only at the uh, top of the channel region. For that uh, you have to do another photolithography right. Any time when you want to remove something and uh, when you want to selectively remove something you are, you are uh, supposed to do a photolithography and then uh, mask the regions that are uh, supposed to be uh, kept safe and then uh, then remove the uh, other regions. So, that, that there is a protocol that you do. So, again you do the same thing where uh, you spin coat or spray coat the photoresist that is the yellow material that you see here and uh, then expose uh, through another mask that, that will be the third mask uh, for uh, this, this particular photolithography step. So, every photolithography step will have a separate mask usually that, that is the case. So, photolithography 3 will have its own separate mask and what you do is that you protect uh, uh, the oxides, the, the oxides at the edge that, that are the field oxides and the oxide uh, over the channel region. You, you are um, trying to protect that region with the photoresist and then remove the oxide that is on the top of uh, the source and drain regions 
Um, so, as you see here, uh, you have uh, removed the photoresist only in the uh, areas where uh, uh, the oxide is there on the top of uh, the source and drain, but you, you protected everything else. And then you etch this oxide um, either with wet etching or with dry etching. And now, um, you can you must be wondering what is this blue color. So, some cases you 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 make a metal contact with two two metals. So everywhere when you when you want to make a contact with uh, this semiconductor material because you have to take connections out. There you need to have a metal layer. And um, so in some cases you you will be having bi bi metal layer. On in some cases you will be having only one metal layer. So on the source and drain regions, what you do you you need to have two metals. Therefore, uh, with the same um, photoresist uh, mask what you do you uh, deposit metal uh, which is aluminum on the top of uh, uh, this and uh, this deposition process is exactly identical to the uh, uh, to one of the scenarios that I have told uh, uh, in the beginning which is like your tea making and then then uh, the vapor coming up and you keeping the lead exactly in the same way what you do you uh, tend to melt the metal you either tend to melt the metal or you you tend to knock out the atoms of the metals in such a way that it will go up and uh, 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 and stick uh, on to the substrate uh, i am coming into that but understand that i i can deposit uh, metal where like everywhere so you cannot selectively deposit metal when you deposit metal like that it goes everywhere and now, uh, when I speak about uh, metal deposition systems, uh, these systems are called physical vapor deposition systems. Uh, there are two major ca uh, categories of uh, physical vapor deposition systems, one is called sputtering and uh, the other is called evaporation. In sputtering what happens is that uh, you are sending a gas that is the sputtering gas uh, into this sputtering chamber, usually uh, all these are happening in a chamber. All, all these things are happening in a chamber and you uh, you first you evacuate the chamber like you have you will you will remove all the gases that are present in the chamber then you insert the sputtering gas into the chamber and you apply a voltage in between the uh, two plates the, the one yellow plate and one uh, say gray plate over here and the yellow plate uh, you you apply voltage in such a way that um, the yellow plate will have a metal uh, and from this to, towards this metal uh, you will have uh, the ions of uh, the gas the sputtering gas uh, coming at uh, a very high speed and then uh, knocking out the uh, atoms of this metal and then these atoms will go and uh, fall on the top plate. So, now, now think now if you are placing uh, a metal uh, say the metal that you want to deposit. Uh, uh, on the top of your wafer uh, on the bottom uh, plate that is the on, on the yellow plate if you keep your uh, required metal and on the uh, gray plate if you are keeping your wafer and if you are uh, uh, letting a gas to go in and all this process happen where uh, the gas molecules are getting ionized and the uh, and the uh, accelerated ionized gas molecules will come and hit these um, the bottom or the yellow um, plate which is otherwise called target uh, from there you knock out the metal atoms and then this metal atoms go and uh, stick on the upper plate where you kept the substrate. Then in that case also you will get a uniform deposition of a very thin metal layer uh, on the top of your metal. So, that is one method of uh, depositing metal on the top of your wafer. Uh, and in the second uh, process uh, where you uh, kind of uh, uh, heat this metal the, the metal that you want to deposit on the top of your wafer you heat this metal to its melting point and uh, then first uh, it will melt and then it will start evaporating. You, you imagine you are you are speaking about melting and evaporating a metal. So, the temperature that you need to apply uh, should be of that order. And if you are able to melt and then it will start evaporating and 
once it is evaporating it goes and it sticks uh, onto the wafer that you have attached on the top on, on the top uh, uh, plate that that is called thermal evaporation and the second type of evaporation is called electron beam evaporation where you uh, you send a, a electron beam you you direct electron beam into this uh, metal that you want to melt and uh, then locally heat it and locally melt it and then uh, then you operate and uh, uh, take the uh, vapors or, or the metal uh, particles or the metal atoms onto the substrate. So, uh, why I have given the analogy of uh, the water boiling and, and then keeping the lid on the top of that exactly the same thing is happening here uh, especially in the case of evaporation because you are boiling the water and when you are keeping a lid on the top of that um, you are able to form a nice layer a nice uniform layer of uh, water vapor on that exactly in the same way if you are able to heat your metal that is in your uh, bottom crucible we call it as crucible and then uh, if you are evaporating that and keeping your substrate on the top of that you will get a nice uniform layer of uh, metal. So, that, that is how this process is done. Uh, where you have a very uh, uniform coating of metal uh, coming on the top of your uh, uh, your uh, this thing your wafer and then uh, that that was the eighth step that you have and now um, you know that uh, when you evaporated uh, the metal which is aluminum the blue color thing you have aluminum falling uh, everywhere on uh, your wafer but you want the aluminum to be there only on the top of your uh, uh, your source and your drain areas but you don't want the aluminum to be there on on the uh, other areas where you have your field oxide or, or or the areas where you have your gate oxide for that uh, fortunately we have kept the photoresist there and you imagine uh, a situation like your stencil painting where your photoresist is your stencil and when you uh, when you evaporate uh, the material it is like painting on the top of stencil and when you remove the stencil you will have uh, only the uh, uh, the paint sticking onto the wall uh, only in the areas where you had uh, uh, you have uh, areas that are open in the stencil. In the same way wherever you had uh, photo resist uh, open there only your metal will stick and uh, the areas where you had photo resist when you remove this photo resist the metals that uh, the metal that is falled on the top of this uh, photoresist will also be removed and eventually you are going to get something like this uh, where you have uh, blue metal areas that, that is aluminum only on the top of your uh, source uh, and drain areas. So, the process of uh, removing metal in this fashion is called lift off. Now, you can correlate uh, or you can compare your uh, the final device that I have shown in the bottom and uh, and the device that you have realized as of now you you are only few steps away only one or two steps away and now uh, we are into the tenth process where uh, you want to have um, gold metal on the top of your uh, gate area and on the top of your uh, aluminum that you have deposited on the uh, uh, source and drain, drain regions for this what you do you will again do one more photolithography step where you spin coat and then you expose using another mask and make patterns like this that you see in the second image and then uh, what you do you deposit gold you either sputter gold or you you operate gold uh, then uh, you do a lift off the the same thing that you have done in the previous step so that you will have uh, metals uh, sticking only to the place that you want and, and you don't have metal sticking to the other areas the unwanted areas and uh, now uh, you observe the fourth figure and the uh, the figure at the bottom right corner you have only one thing remaining that is the body contact for that what you do you flip the vapor and you deposit metal everywhere in the body side. So, um, finally, uh, we have realized the device and uh, we are uh, exactly the same as what, what we see in the uh, bottom right corner. Now, as I said uh, for, uh, for showing one particular logic or doing one particular operation you need several number of such transistors to be connected in a particular fashion. As of now I have discussed uh, only the manufacturing or the fabrication of one particular transistor 
but if you uh, if you imagine the same things replicating all over your wafer um, you will end up having uh, say millions or billions of transistors everywhere and more than this when you when you try to realize such kind of circuits or such kind of logics you will have more fabrication coming into this the picture uh, where you you want to connect uh, uh, these individual uh, transistors in, in a particular style so that you can uh, you can make certain function to happen and uh, with that uh, you will end up having such kind of a wafer that you see here a circular wafer with the different uh, uh, different dies so um, if you if you look at this circular wafer that is so here uh, usually at the periphery at the periphery of this wafer the yield will not be so great the the devices or the, the chips that you have fabricated at the periphery of this uh, wafer will not be so great so that people tend to uh, not take that and they will skip this and they will uh, take only the wafer only the uh, chips that are good and that are uh, at the uh, at the inward regions but now now you know that you have fabricated on a complete uh, wafer but uh, for taking individual chips you have to do uh, cutting cutting of this wafer so uh, cutting of uh, the wafer is otherwise called uh, diasing and for diasing also you have uh, sophisticated in, uh, instruments involved uh, usually in diasing what you do is that you uh, either have a, a rotating disc that is moving on the top of your wafer and uh, in, in a particular fashion and then uh, you know making cards uh, uh, wherever you want or or you have say dicings like dicing uh, saws that are available uh, where you have very fine needle uh, or very fine string that is moving and you, you pass it through that and uh, you, you can cut it or, or you have several methods to do that. So, uh, so once you do that um, then you test each and every chip. So, it is not um, certain that all of your chip will work definitely not because uh, in your clean room at least say if you have one particle that is falling on the top of your wafer that chip that is in that uh, area uh, where the dust has fallen will not work because uh, the, the process may not be so complete there and you have to remove those chips that are not working. But still you will be having enough number of you, you will be ensuring that your process has uh, given you enough number of uh, wafers for uh, you uh, to do your further processing. So, uh, the testing is another important thing that you have to do in your microfabrication because if you are not testing and if you are just assembling the, uh, the chip into a package and then uh, putting in your uh, computer or in your, in your uh, smartphone, uh, it might not work or it might fail after some time. And, uh, and as of now what I have discussed is the fabrication on the top of uh, silicon. So, once you uh, complete the fabrication of uh, an IC chip on the top of uh, 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 silicon that has to be diced and that has to be packaged that is very important because you cannot give uh, a die just like that and then uh, make somebody to make circuit for that. But uh, what you do is that you, you pack it completely. Uh, won't do a package uh, and then uh, give it as single pieces. So, everywhere when you see as ICs either you can see uh, the IC that looks like uh, what I show in the left side or sometimes when you see chips bigger chips like processor chips uh, you it may look like uh, what you see in the uh, image over here on the right. So, uh, if you take a cross section of the uh, of the chip that you have um, right here in the left side it might look something like this uh, where your uh, red color die is fixed at the middle and you have some uh, leads uh, the blue color leads that are there and to the leads you make uh, the yellow color connections through a, a technique called wire bonding. Uh, that is how you make the system complete and then, then you kind of seal it then you kind of uh, put some plastic material and seal it completely. And uh, provide it as a single uh, single IC. Uh, exactly in the same way if you look at a processor uh, the, the routing and the bonding uh, of wires will be quite complex uh, not as easy as what you see uh, in an IC where you have only few number of uh, legs. 
in, in chips may be you have say 64 leads or 128 leads coming out and you have that many number of wire mounting coming to picture. So, that is not easy to realize. So, there are uh, there are sophisticated uh, facilities that do this particular work and uh, there are separate research beings for this purpose as well. Packaging is a different uh, uh, research domain and uh, packaging industry is uh, different altogether. So, that is how um, a uh, chip is getting fabricated. Uh, I hope uh, I could convey uh, this in the mode of information so that uh, people who are not uh, that aware of these techniques uh, will also be able to understand and appreciate how um, ICs are fabricated, how uh, uh, or how uh, MEMS devices are fabricated or how solar cells are fabricated. The process remains almost same, but just that uh, the uh, the individual process remains same, but the the flow at which that you use these processes will be different. So, that, that is a whole difference. Otherwise, uh, things are uh, more more of same. So, thank you so much for your attention.